So we are in this uh, series called Family Moving Forward. And uh, like I said last week, I believe that uh, God has a green light for us to move forward. It was God's intention for us not to live alone, right? God's plan was not for us to live alone. We were called to live in community. We're called to live together. And at the same time, we're called to experience family. And family is this unit that God has planned for us to raise the kids and raise the next generation. It, it's God's way of seeing the heaven be filled, right? And, and so, so I believe that God wants us to move forward. And uh, I like this verse that you find in uh, Psalm 127, verse 1. 127, verse 1. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Here it says that unless the Lord builds the house, those that are building the house are building in vain. And what I like about this verse is that we see that God wants to get involved in building our home, right? It says that God, is, uh, His desire is to build, build our homes. His desire is to be present in our home. And, and it also says that if we try to build our home alone, it just doesn't work. That's what it's saying here. If you try to live your life independent of God, it's not going to work. And when it comes to living your Christian walk or living your faith, it's not always easy, right? It would be pretty easy if our faith was just about talk. <laughs> I think we'd, we would do pretty well if, if faith was just about talk. But we know that faith is about walk. And this is what you find in the Bible where it says, The just shall live by faith. So faith is depending on God, it's trusting in the Lord, it's to walk with, with Him. But it's also amazing to remember that the desire of God is to build our home. So, so that's what we have to uh, store into our heart, it's to know that God wants to build our home. And at the same time, I've got to let Him in. At the same time, I have to cooperate with Him because this desire is to build the home and there's a good chance that he's going to build that home with you in mind, right? Using you, uh, channeling himself through you as you obey and as you become available for him. Amen? So one of the things that needs to happen, if I want to have a healthy marriage, if I want to see my, my family move forward, I've got to learn to fight for my marriage. Can you say to your neighbor that you've got to learn to fight? You got to learn to fight for your marriage. You got to learn to fight for what God has given you. You got to defend your turf. You got to take authority. You got to stand on, on what God has given you and say, This is mine. That doesn't belong to the enemy. That doesn't belong to the world. It belongs to me. So I'm going to stand tall. I'm going to bring up the shield of faith. I'm going to use the sword of the Spirit. I am, and I'm going to wage war against anything that would want to come and destroy and damage my unit, my, my, my nuclear of my family amen so God has called us to fight for what is ours and we have that authority because the Bible says that we are all in charge of a metron a metron is my sphere of influence so when it comes to the Laney's when it comes to 23 Berry Bay God has called this mantle on my life to lead God has put this mantle on my life to fight for my home right so God has put this uh, this mantle on us to fight for our marriage one of the things that I want to share to you is as I look at my own journey, I've been married 21, uh, 31 years, going on 32, and uh, I was looking at what does it mean to um, fight for my marriage. And there's a lot of stuff I could have written down, and there's lots of stuff I could say, and I'm limited in time. Probably I'll touch that later on in the series. But I came with three things I wanted to share to you when it comes to fighting for my family. And it might not be things that you think of. It might be, it's a little different. But I, I really think that if that is uh, applied, and if we want that in our if we want to have a healthy family, a healthy marriage, healthy relationship, I think it can be really a game a changer. And at the same time, I just ask you to be open up to what Holy Spirit will whisper to your, to your ears or to your heart. So when it comes to building a healthy family, I really think, I really believe that I need to come out of my comfort zone. If I want to fight for my marriage, I need to understand that fighting involves coming out of my comfort zone. And if you think about relationships, 
they will cause you to come out of your comfort zone. You'll never, if you want to have healthy relationship, you'll have to come out of your comfort zone. You won't be comfortable, right? It's for example, if, I, if, I, if we talk and, and, uh, <clears throat> and let's say I, I struggle with being easily hurt, and I say, you know what, well, you know what, it's, it's kind of my problem, uh, and this is the way I am, so I'm called to live with this uh, bad habit of being easily hurt or reading between the lines, right? Uh, reading between the lines is like, for example, you have a conversation at breakfast, and, and then you're, uh, uh, you leave, uh, fr- uh, you, you leave in, your own, in, in your own direction to do your day, and one word or one phrase hits you, and then you're writing a novel based on that phrase, and you can't wait to go back home just to explode based on the novel that you wrote in your head, right? And, and so that can change, right? When you think about... Uh, building a healthy marriage, when you think about fighting for your marriage, I've got to be open to the fact that I need to be extended. I need to extend myself. Like, let's say, for example, it's not in your character to show affection. Or well, you, you might say, well, you know, it, it's not really me to show affection. Well, you've got to extend yourself, right? Well, it, it's not really me to have a, words of affirmation to people around, right? It's not really me to, to encourage people. Well, it, it's not about you, really. It's about what you can become, right? So you're, you're called to grow. You're called to extend yourself. If you want healthy relationships, you don't have a choice. You have to extend yourself. For example, if you're always defensive, you're always having your claws out, you're starting a conversation, and, in, and you're protecting yourself all the time, that too can change. So, so the first thought I want to share to you this morning is that if I want to fight for my marriage, if I rephrase this, what is fighting for my marriage? It is to be able to extend yourself and be willing to change. If that doesn't happen, you won't be, you, you're not fighting for your marriage. If you're not willing to adjust, everything needs adjustment, right? Um, imagine if you had musicians here that would never tune the guitar, but the moment that the guitar is not tuned, they would throw it away. Well, it's not working anymore. But we live in a, in a society, of cons- we're a consuming society, and we don't learn to fix things, right? Um, we have a problem right now with our washer. It comes, our, it comes to a certain level and it overflows. So we got the specialist to come in, looked at it and said, it's fine. And according to my wife, it's not fine. <laughs> <laughs> and so now we, uh, she kind of learned where to dr- bring the water up and... And uh, the thing is, we were saying, okay, it's almost 10 years old, you put money into it, then you'll, maybe it will last another year, and then you have to buy a new one, so is it worth fixing it? And we live in a, in a culture where we're not very good to fix things, right? So what happened is that we move on. And, uh, and uh, so, so when it comes to marriage, we got to be careful not to have this mindset that it's not working, it's not where we expect, it, it, it's not what we expected it, it's not turning out according to our own expectation, and then we start to look up and say, well, maybe I did a mistake, or maybe I'm, I, I should look on the other side of the fence or, or just move on, right? So I, I think it's important for me to know that if I, if I want to see a healthy marriage, i got to fight for my marriage, and that means that I need to extend myself. Mm. Uh, can you tell your neighbor that God can train an old dog new tricks? Can you do that? <laughs> well, coming out of my comfort zone, it's not to be passive. It's not to be passive. And not to have a whatever attitude. You know, one of the biggest things that damages marriage is passivity. When we're passive. When we sit on the sideline and we don't get active. When we just see the cars pass by. Where we blame and we, uh, and we stop moving forward. I think this is the biggest thing. When a husband doesn't stand and fight for his marriage, where a wife doesn't stand and fight for it's her marriage, where the parents don't fight uh, for the kids, where you have this passive approach of saying, you know, I'm responsible for myself. The importance is that, is that I, I'm safe and I'm doing well. And the moment you're married, you're, you can't live 
for your own. You can't focus on yourself because you got this crew or these kids, this, uh, uh, this uh, wife that you or husband that you're called to live with. So it's important to, uh, to not to be passive. One of the story of passivity that always, when I was preparing, that always comes back to my, to my memory is the story of Eli, the high priest where he was serving, uh, the, was serving in the temple, and the presence of God or the words of God was, was rare. This is where Samuel was born. And what happened is that he didn't care for his son, never gave direction to his son, and there, his sons uh, went wild, and, and, it was, and God did not bless. And the reason why all this happened, it was because Eli was passive. Passivity is a danger and I know that passivity sleeps at your door all the time because when things do not go the way we want them to go when we get hurt one of the things we want to do is shut down you see we shut down at the same time that shut down is also a sense of control I'm not gonna have sex I'm not gonna talk I'm not gonna do this do that it's kind of a control but you shut down and when you shut down what you're saying is God don't build my house so when you shut down, you're blocking the door for God to do what he wants to do. So God wants to build your house, but you can't be passive. I like what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity. And the word timidity there is the word coward. God has not given us a spirit of cowardness. But of power, that means God's ability in us, love, his motive, and discipline the ability to bring it to pass. So that's a spirit that God has given us. God has not given me a spirit of coward, of a coward where I quit, I throw the towel, and I walk away, but God has given me a spirit of power. Can you say power to your neighbor? Power. Can you say love? Can you say love? Can you say sound mind or discipline? That it, I'm, able, I'm able to carry it through. I'm able to carry it through because God is with me. I'm not alone in this. So the spirit that God has placed in me is a, a spirit of, of a person that's called to fight for what God has given me. So my marriage needs my participation. And when it comes to fighting for my marriage, I need to do the first move. Ah, how many of you, you like to do the first move? Most, most of us, we think that we should not do the first move because the person that we're with doesn't deserve that we do the first move. Especially when we get hurt, we wait for the other person to do the first move, right? Huh? I don't know if it's only your case, but for, my, for our case, we have, I have this battle, Michelin has this battle, who will do the first move, right? The reason why I do, I'm called to do the first move it's because I'm called to obey God. You know, marriage is a God thing. I'm not called to wait. I'm not called to be passive. I'm called to make the first move. I'm called to uh, reach out. I'm called to seek reconciliation. I'm called to do that extra step. And is it easy? No. This is where I can use the mic in my favor. <laughs> No, it's not easy. It, it goes against the flesh. It really does. It really does, right? Because what you want to do is to stay in your corner and say, you know what, it's her fault. I'll use me, for example. My wife is not here, so I can say, it's her fault. You know, it's, uh, it's for her to do the first move. Like, you know, we'll see how godly she is by her making the first move. And at the same time, God is whispering in my heart, you do the first move. I did the first move for you. And I always do the first move for you. Please, Claude, do the first move. Please step out of your comfort zone. Step forward. And, and, and I believe that when we do this, reconciliation come. And I think that when you show that expression that is really love, it, it rocks your partner. Especially when the partner knows that it might be, for me, her fault. And you build a bridge, it really shows that you're, it's not about you, but it's about your marriage, right? So I need to make the first move. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Therefore, if you are offering your offering at the altar, and there, and there remember that your brother has something against you, you're talking here about worship. So we cannot have this uh, relationship with God 
and forsaking the relationship with others because that's what it says. Leave your offering behind. Leave your gift there in the front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gifts. Wow. I don't always like that verse. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm going to focus on you, God. I'm going to worship you. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Read my, read my Bible, have my devotion, and, and continue with my relationship with God. And God says, you go. You do the first move. Reconcile. Do, do what you're called to do. Open your mouth. Uh, share, express your heart. Be vulnerable. And, and when you do this, you're creating a platform for God to work. You know what God is looking for? A platform for, to intervene. So when I shut myself up and I walk away, I harden my heart, it prevents God of doing what he does so well. Recon, to work on reconciliation. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. It says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Peacemakers. Peacemaker is someone that takes a step forward. It doesn't talk here about peacekeeping. It talks about peacemaker. As you step in, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not avoiding or appeasing. And that's what peacekeeping is. You avoid, you walk away, you, uh, you don't deal with it, you pretend it's not there, you throw it under the carpet, you know. And the problem with throwing it under the carpet or putting, putting it in the closet, a long haul what happened is that, have you ever put some stuff in there? Probably, probably never happened to you, but you probably saw that on TV, where they threw a lot of stuff in the, in the closet, and closet, closet, and then at one point they have a problem to open the closet, and, and they have uh, one thing to put in the closet, and when they open the closet, everything comes Come, come out, probably it's just in, in, in TV that you see that, right? But the thing is, when you just store and put things under the carpet time and time over again, every time that you put something, everything comes along. When you don't deal with your hard issues, when you, when you don't deal with what's before you, uh, when you go through uh, a, a situation, all the past follows and this is where instead of dealing with one issue, you're dealing with a ton of issues because you've never addressed anything. And when it comes to sometimes the way we live, we think that time fixes things. No, it doesn't. I wish it would. It doesn't. The more you go, the more you have a tendency of justifying your style of life. And also what happens is that you have to harden your heart to deal with what is before you. You see? So, so when it comes to uh, being a peacemaker, it's not to run away. And it's not also to become a carpet, right? Where you lose your color, meaning that you're now a gray and, and you're not yourself anymore. So sometimes we think that we are at peace in our home, but what, the only thing you do is you become a carpet, we got to learn to talk about things. Confrontation is part of life. we got to talk about the issues that are at hand. You know, because if we don't, we're going to get ourselves in the same situation in a year from now. Because it's never been addressed, it's never been being dealt with. Does that make sense? And, and that's hard. That is fighting for your marriage. I prefer to store things inside. I don't know for you, but I know for my wife, she has to go fishing. And sometimes she doesn't always catch a fish. I seal it. Sometimes I'm like an oyster. Like, God, you need to have a crowbar to open that heart up. But for me, I've got to learn. I can't put that on her. I've got to learn to open up myself. It's my call. If I want to fight for my marriage, I've got to open that oyster. I've got to let it open. I've got to become vulnerable. I've got to be willing to be hurt. And you think about an oyster, what's inside of the oyster? Oyster is not very scary, right? And so I got to become vulnerable. I've got to say, God, I want to take a risk here because, um, because I'm fighting for my marriage. I'm going to say this. Walking in humility and being real is really what it is to, to fight for your marriage. When, you, you, when you're yourself, when you're not just having the talk, when you go beyond the image and you say, hey, this is who I am. I want to fix this. So, so um, how do you resolve conflicts? How do you uh, do the first move is that you want to face it. You want to face it. I like what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, but speaking truth in love, right? Speaking truth in love. And, and so we need truth, right? <laughs> but we also need love. But we don't just want love, right? Because we want truth because they're hand in hand. And, and Jesus loved us enough to tell us the truth, right? 
So when it comes to relationship, you want to fight for your family. You want to build the bridges. Um, I think this is so, so huge. You, you, you got to realize that God is all about redemption. God is all about redemption. So God wants to redeem your relationships. Any relationship that is, that is broken, God's desire is to redeem them. I don't know exactly how that looks. I don't know really what he has in mind, but I know one thing, he wants to redeem it. So I've got to be sensitive enough and flexible enough and, and to, to, be, to be able to cooperate with him when it comes to, uh, when it comes to seeing uh, reconciliation. You look at the Bible. The Bible is a book of prevention, right? If you do this, sowing and reaping. But also the Bible is also a book to show us what we do when we blow it. So, so God is there. He gave us words for prevention, but he also gave us words for when we don't go according to his ways and how can we turn from that. So God is all about prevention. Can you tell your neighbor that God is all about um, prevention? And he's all about restoration. He's all about restoration. So God wants to redeem us, right? And, uh, and, and, uh, and sometimes we're scared of it. We're scared of taking a step forward. A few weeks ago, me and my wife were talking about changing our countertops in the kitchen. And so I go see this guy, I like to change the countertops. And, and he said, well, if you want to save money, um, remove your, uh, if you can remove your, yourself, the countertop, then you're going to save some money. And I didn't like what he said, right? <laughs> I tried to have a deal that he would come and remove the countertop, but he said, no, that's the cheapest, that's the lowest I can go. So then, so as I do it so well when it comes to procrastination, uh, I, I, I was afraid to change a countertop because I didn't think I was able to fix it, right? So what I did is I just let it go there for a while and, and Michelin would say, you know, we, he's coming on Monday and that was on a, on a Tuesday before. I'm saying, yeah, yeah, but you know, I've got some meetings in the evening. It just doesn't, doesn't work. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. And so, and then Sunday, Saturday arrives, and I said, well, I can't really fix it on Saturday. I've, I've got this, I've got church, and then I'll, I'll, I'll fix it on Sunday. And Michelin looks at me, you can't fix it on Sunday. You know how you are after three services. No, I don't think you'll be able to fix it on Sunday. I'll do it on Monday morning before the guy comes. <laughs> <laughs> so there, Sunday night comes, and Michelin is starting to get the tools out. So that's really it. <laughs> A bad sign. <laughs> or pro pro procrastination, right? I was afraid of that stupid countertop. It's unreal. And I look at the garburetor, the sink, and to remove that. And then I, I, I get my tools out. And, and you know, I, I was saying to him, I don't have the tools. If I would have the tools, I could do a good job. So I might as well pay more and get the guy to fix it. But then I started to play with it. And then, oh, remove one part of it. Oh. Can do this. I said, Michelin, remove the first part. <laughs> I'm good, eh? Your husband is pretty good, eh? <clears throat> and then later on, I, I like uh, after um, longer than most of you, uh, <laughs> take, it took me longer, but I got it all out. And I was pretty excited that I did that, right? The problem is sometimes we're afraid because we think we can't do it. We look at the situation in marriage and we say, I, 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 I just can't. So what we do is we avoid. We shut ourselves up. And we just procrastinate. The thing is, it's the Lord that builds the house. You see? He wants you to cooperate. And he's going to bless you. He's going to give you the tools, the ability, the idea, the creativity to fix your marriage or to see your marriage be healthy. And that's where you don't want to give up. That's why... Fighting for your marriage is huge because the moment you get your spear out and you say, I'm going to do this, God stands beside you. And I like the story of Joshua when he stood before the congregation of Israel. He says, me and my house, we will serve the Lord. God heard him. When Shammah stayed and stood in the field of Lentiles and the Philistine was coming when all the shoulders, soldiers ran away, he stand with his sword at hand. He says, this field belongs to the Lord. And you know what he did? He was, he was able to conquer the Philistine and he was considered a hero of King David. I, I look at that and how many of us we shrink away because we think we can't. And we maybe can't, but God can. Maybe I come short, but God can. I've got to finish my phrase when it comes to relationship, but God can. All the time. 
You can't leave it at you. You can't leave it. You can't leave it. You can't stop at you. You got to embrace faith. Tell your neighbor that you need to embrace faith. That God can, right? God can. And it's to take a hold of grace that is is God merited favor, but also God's divine ability. Grace is is a merited favor, but it's also his divine ability for us to do what we're called to do. Secondly, how do you fight for your family? Is I need to walk in forgiveness and restitution. I've got to walk in forgiveness. I've got to forgive and let go. A lot easier said than done, right? But I need to forgive. Mm. I need to forgive. It's not optional. And it's not, a, it's not driven by emotion. It's driven by your decision to follow Jesus. You've got to forgive and you've got to let go. You've got some people that are living 25 years ago. I can talk about a situation that it's not linked to Gospel Mission Church. I remember my younger ministry. I went to visit this couple that were in their 80s. And they called and said, come and help us, Pastor. Come help us, Pastor. And I came in that household, and it was a wreck. I could not believe. And they were yelling at each other, and I I thought that she was going to kill them. It was such an ugly picture. And they were talking about things that were further in the past than the age I had. Like 30, 40 years ago, never been dealt with, never been forgiven, and they were not able to move on. It was in their presence. So, so their house was a spiritual dump. Looked well, though. Came to church, nice smile and all that. Praise the Lord, hallelujah. But their home was a dump. And because they've never embraced forgiveness. You got to forgive. You got to let go. That's the call of Jesus. Yeah, but pastor, but yeah. Well, look at Jesus on Calvary. The reason why I forgive is because I was forgiven much. Where would I be? If I would be God over Claude, I would have given up on myself. God is always there forgiving me, forgiving me, brings me to repentance. I'm won by His grace. It's so amazing. And because of that, I want to walk in purity of life and all this because He's so amazing. But it all starts when I embrace forgiveness. And how do I embrace forgiveness is when I remember how much I was forgiven. And the reason why we have a problem to forgive is because we're self-righteous. We're self-righteous. We look down at people. You look down at your wife. You look down at your, at your husband. You look down at people around you because you think you're better. You might not say it, but that's what it means. Because when you don't forgive, what you're saying is that you're better. Because you don't look at yourself in the mirror. You're walking with, uh, with a microscope at hand instead of looking your, at yourself in the mirror. So the thing is, don't walk with, don't walk with a magnifying glass at hand, at hand and, 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 and put people under the, uh, under the micro, or, or I will say, the, I'll use a microscope, one or the other, right? To put, don't put people under the microscope. Look at yourself in the mirror and say, why I can't forgive when I was forgiven so much? And then you've then you got to ask God to heal your heart, restore your heart, and realize that's your mandate, that's your call, and that's what it is to fight for your family. It's to forgive. Otherwise, it just piles up, you know? Look what it says in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that there's no bitter root, uh, that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defiles many. If I don't forgive, I'll have bitterness and it's going to infect people around me. Like it or not, even if you don't want to, it will transpire through your life. It's going to come out because whatever is in comes out, willingly, willingly or not, right? So... We're called to live in forgiveness. Matthew 18, verse 21 says, And Peter came up and said to him, How many times should I forgive? Seven times? And he thought it was kind of the top. And Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, I do not say that you, to, uh, to you seven times, but 77, uh, 77 times. That's saying that you always are called to forgive. Psalm 130, verse 3 says, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sin, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there's forgiveness. So God doesn't even give, keep, keeps a list of my sins. He forgives them. So it's important for us to walk in forgiveness. So forgiveness is huge. That could be a sermon on its own. But also restitution is huge too. What is restitution? Is when you give back something that you've stolen. So restitution is when you ask forgiveness. Well, pastor, it's not my style. 
to ask forgiveness. Well, let it become your style. Fighting for your marriage is to be able to admit you're wrong and to say, I'm sorry, I blew it, forgive me, and to be quick to repent. I think that when we harbor that, when we say yes to this, this is where we are able to build a bridge and we can walk in victory and also we can see our marriage uh, be kept from uh, what the enemy has in store for us. So restitution, forgiveness is huge, but restitution is so important that we do the first step to say, hey, I'm sorry. And mean it from your heart, not just to say you're sorry just because, but, but because you want to see a change, right? So asking forgiveness is so important. One of the things that me and Michelin, we've done so many times in the last 30, almost 32 years, is that we've started over so many times. Like we come together and we have this argument or this situation, and then we reconcile, and then we realign ourselves and say, let's start over again. Let's start over again. I don't know how many times we've done that. And for us, it really works. Uh, for sure, when you say, let's start, let, let's start over again, uh, if you don't, uh, if you don't um, correct your course, it's, you're going to land to the same place. But the ability to be together and say, hey, hey let's, let's move on, okay? Let, let, let us not camp here. Let's forgive, and let, let's forgive one another. Let's look at what we can improve, and let's start over again. I don't know, that's such a great feeling, right? It really is such a great feeling to be able to say, let's start over again. <laughs> and, and I believe God wants us to have this mindset because, again, we, we're, when you say, let's start over again, you, you, go beyond, uh, you go beyond what the world says, right? Uh, that uh, when it doesn't work, you change cars. When you're, if you're not happy with your car, you just change it. My last point here, I need to acknowledge my humanity. Marriage doesn't solve problems, by the way. For you that married, you probably know that now it doesn't solve problems at the same time it doesn't create problems okay so don't blame it blame it blame it on your marriage marriage exposes the problems just magnifies what's already in your heart look at how you're behaving in your marriage it's because of what's inside so it's so marriage doesn't cause problem doesn't save you from problem it just exposes problems it really shows what's in your heart. So what you want to do is you want to see God heal your heart. It magnifies what's inside of me. We had an elder board meeting last Thursday, and uh, we, I, I was talking about this topic, and, and uh, Ron, and the, uh, I think it was him, and, and the elders were talking about that marriage is more than to make me happy, but maybe it's also to make me holy. And sometimes we forget that, that marriage is way more than just to make me happy, but it's also to make me holy. The platform of marriage, it forces transformation. It really does. That if you want to have a healthy marriage, transformation will hit you right in the forehead. Not what the other has to change, but what you need to change. And, and, uh, and so I need to, to remember my humanity that I have holes in my life. I, I, need, uh, I, I need to go beyond myself. That I'm called not to live for myself, but live for my marriage. You know the first thing a baby does? When it's born, it says, I, 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 I. And maturity is, you stop saying this, right? Maturity, when you have a baby that says, I, I, what you want them at one point is to have a own job, and bring their own, <laughs> take care of their own finances, and then you're freer, right? Not, not for that motive. But the thing is, you want them to grow in maturity. Well, sometimes how we behave in marriage is, I, 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 I. Marriage is not about fighting for yourself, but fighting for your marriage. If my husband, if this, is ch if this change, I, I, I. It's not about the I, it's about the us. You can't say I anymore, you gotta say us, you see? So, so one of the things you need to realize is that we're dealing with humanity. And uh, Proverbs 13.10 says, pride leads to conflict. So I don't wanna walk and live in pride. Right? James chapter 5, verse 16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you might be healed. But it talks about confessing your sin, realizing your humanity. You know, I believe that God has, has blessed you with relationships, especially when it comes to marriage. Your marriage is worth fighting for. Don't quit. Don't throw a towel. Ask God. 
realize that he wants to build your house. He says, unless the, the Lord builds the house, those that labor, labor in vain. Can we ask him to come in our lives? And can we align himself, can we align ourselves with his will and say, God, yeah, I want to fight. My prayer this morning and wherever you are on this journey of life that you would say, hey, I'm going to fight for my marriage. And maybe you have to have a conversation after the service, talk with your wife or with your husband and say, let's start over again. You address things, you talk about it, you realign your direction and you say, let's start over again. Amen? I would ask you to stand. Father, I thank you for the blessing of marriage that your thought and your heart was for us to enjoy life and, and to enjoy this life. Um, you've invited us and called us to live in community. And so, Father, I just pray for an urgency and uh, the spirit of a warrior like Shama that stood in the field of Lentil and says, I'm going to stand for that field. I'm not going to let the Philistine take over that field because I've got kids to feed. I've got a family. I've got a nation to protect. Father, I just pray that we would live beyond ourselves and that we would experience transformation. That we would live, not just talk. That we would walk and not just know the solutions, but live them. And we can't do this on our own, so we ask the help of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we just pray that, uh, that we would be led by you, that we would walk in the Spirit that we would move from where we are today, Father, that we would grow in maturity and grow in commitment and vision that you've called us to fight for our families. Amen.